we had? 30 minutes. I've got a here at 1.30. I brought these for you, just so you can look at them, not we have to use them in the interview. But just to your point, if you look at the uh, health expenditures in the United States versus GDP, I mean, 8,254% increase. <laughs> and I know this is a long time period, but this is just to show you that it's the fastest growing expense in the nation is health care, right? And 17%, $2.5 trillion now. And, um, and yet when you look at the, when you look at um, per capita spending, so here's the uh, U.S. compared to other countries in the world. Yeah. But when you look at our infant mortality rate, which is average life, this is average life expectancy, which is a, a, a ratio that all the it's countries going down. use. No, here's the United States. We're right there with Cuba and Cyprus and Ireland, just a little bit better than those guys. But the, you know, the life expectancy is highest in well, Japan, This is not San a time chart. No. This is just the countries. Yeah. So you would think that for all the money we spend, people would live a long time. Not true. It's very strange. Because we spend money on the wrong stuff. Not that we for spend so on the wrong things. stuff. We don't spend money We're to keep efficient. people healthy. We don't keep people healthy. And we don't do preventative. Yeah, that's Kaiser right. We don't do the preventative care, right? Anybody will tell you Do you know you how much disease, how much disease is, you know, I, people talk about um, the cost of care. Yeah, just a piece of lint. I, um, I like to talk about um, why do you have to get, why do you need to get sick in the first place? Why do you, why do you, th you think it's for, you know, uh, ordained that you're supposed to become a diabetic when you're 55? No. <laughs> there are things that you can do that prevent you ever needing to be That's insulin. absolutely true. And a lot of people think that when they hit a certain age or, you know, elder years, mm -hmm. that all these things will happen to them, and it's like faded that yeah. way. Yeah, no. But it's not true anymore. Yeah. We have the technology. We it, can prevent exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah, well, my mother and my grandma, yeah, back then they didn't have drugs. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't have the drugs we have today. Yeah. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to have conditions that, you know, hypertension and all that is all avoidable. And I've got a great example of just, like, osteoporosis and broken bones. And just where, so where do we spend all our money in healthcare today? And what I'm going to say is, yeah, if somebody breaks your hip, you want to take care of it, but how about we avoid people? breaking their hips. If we just put a little bit more money into the front end, um, you're going to see the back end costs come down. That's the modern view. Yeah. And it's a very encouraging, positive view yeah. of things. It means, yes, you can be healthier longer. Yeah. It is within your power to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's everyone working together. But the hard part is, um, you know how the money flows is how the money flows. And moving the money from one end to the other means somebody loses and somebody gains, and it's the loss for all the different factions in healthcare, which makes it, the change is hard. That's all, change is hard. Change is hard. Change is hard, change is hard, and change is hard. Would you, would you agree with uh, Josh uh, Green in his statement that change is hard, but we are in a change, we are like in a it change. or not? Yeah, we, we, we have no choice, because um, it's not sustainable. And um, with the Health Care Reform Act, uh, we call it PIPACA. So there's a nickname for it, but the Patient Care Affordability Act. Um, I don't want to say Obamacare. <laughs> it's not polite. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's true. I got, I got some email about yeah, that. You know, yeah. don't use that term. Oh, they said. Yeah, because it, no, it's 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 a little bit pejorative, right? Yeah, so it's yeah. like Obamacare, but I was like, oh, that's what I wanted. It's a nice shorthand for it. Uh, but the the federal act, right? The, health, the federal reform act um, has now created the burning platform for the change solely by saying we're going to cut payments, and um, but you can you can make it up on performance. So now the game has changed, the rules have changed, the rules of engagement have changed. I've heard that, and uh, I wonder how that works. You, we're going to cut payments, but you're going to make it up on performance. How, how do you do that? We're going we're to pay you less, right. but we want more. Yeah, well, you, you, can, well you, can, you, can, you can make up the difference by doing the right work at the right time, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, if, if, you are, um, if you're in the hospital, and um, we end up, um, because we didn't wash our hands, somebody, you catch an infection, right? And then that means that you're in the hospital for seven more days. Um, why sh the government's saying, why should we pay for that? I've heard that. Yeah. That's really why absurd, isn't that? it? That's absurd. <laughs> well, I actually think that what they're saying is, uh, wash your hands and prove the quality of care. So when you, I don't know if you heard the statistic, that um, um, the number of people that die, um, um, not because of the reason they were admitted in the hospital, but they died because of some mistake that happens in the hospital, yeah. some cause yeah. that's created in the hospital. Something else, yeah. It's like a, a 747 crashing every other day. Is that acceptable? That Would that be acceptable for the airline industry? No. It's acceptable for healthcare today? No. 
So it, I don't is think that people realize realize um, that's awful. how dangerous hospitals are. Keep and you out the, of the, the hospital. Mistakes, the mistakes. I always say, why do you want to be in the hospital so long? <laughs> really Get out as fast as you can. <laughs> no, so mistakes, um, it's one of the, what's becoming more transparent. What, what we knew in the industry for a long time, what's becoming more transparent, is the stuff that we don't do so well. Yeah. Mistakes well, happen, um, and duplication happens. Uh, it's the only industry in the world where you pay twice, three times for the same thing. Does that, does that include uh, tests maybe that you don't need? Yeah. I was, I was going to do this. This is a great one. New York Times article of an orthopedic surgeon who um, he's on a campaign right now to because uh, he's, he's upset with his industry for what he considers unnecessary surgery. So he took 31 kind of um, um, pitchers, athletes in baseball, did an MRI of their shoulder, and he asked his colleagues, um, you know, how many of these, right, <laughs> would need surgery? 91% could be justified. And none of these guys had pain or, or problems. He just took healthy people, healthy pitchers, and did an MRI. Ooh, there's something wrong. 91% of them could, there's do, something could wrong. do surgery. Put you in there, do surgery, <laughs> get paid, and completely justified, right? So that's when we talk about unnecessary care. We're talking about, well, did you really need to do surgery on that person? So... So he, what he's trying to do is educate people on the um, misinformation that happens yeah. through testing, like MRI. But you know, they yeah. say that you are the most, you are the most interested person in your own health. Nobody c should yes. care as much as yeah. you care. And That's so what that, we want. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's what we want. Yes. And when we say, um, so before you get sick, how do we get you interested in your care, in your health? How do we get this? That's 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 the million dollar question. How do I get you to be interested in your health? before you get sick, not just when you got sick. And Kaiser is special yes. on that, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, Kaiser talks about preventative medicine, mm -hmm. and if you talk to a Kaiser patient, the Kaiser patient will tell you that Kaiser, I mean, they, mm -hmm. they, yeah. they get the message They know on it, this. yeah. Yeah, We're all, we, are, we are after you. I mean, you're a, you're a member, and we look at you as a lifetime member, and we have a responsibility to fulfill a promise to you, which is to keep you healthy. So that means I want to, if you're going to get anything, I want to catch it really early. And I want to avoid you getting any disease at all. That's our that's our mission, right? And then when you do when you are ill, get it done quickly, get it done early, and then and get you home. That's different from the other models. It, it it is, and it's not because people don't want to. In fact, I'm really proud of Hawaii Healthcare. So we're kind of I'm telling you what I'm going to say, so just so you know. But I'm really proud of Hawaii Healthcare because everybody is working right now towards um, this more holistic model of total health, right? And it's enabled by um, the federal reform because they've changed the way that the people are getting paid. So, and actually, HMSA has been working closely with um, the healthcare systems in town to do exactly the same. They pay for performance. They're saying, look, they held flat their pay, they're increasing their contracts, and said, but you can earn more for good quality. And that's what that's this what is you're seeing. It's great incentive. It's great incentive because everybody wins. The patients win. The caregivers win because they're doing the right thing. They finally can do the, the right thing, right? Um, and so it's a win-win for everyone. But it means change, and it's hard. And if you're not prepared to do it, you only see the lost slide. So is it, is it, is it that? Yeah. Yeah. I know you're recording, but the little yellow tape symbol is... is uh, That's because there's no and, tape in there. Okay, yeah. so we're okay. I we're not chip. recording yet. Are we recording yet already? Yes. Oh, I didn't know we were recording already. Okay. Yeah. I thought we were just kind of practicing. We're, we're, no, we're, we're, we're in real deal. Oh, okay, good. All I right. love this, though. This okay, is the way good. to do it. Okay, know? good. Okay, good. All right. So, oh, I didn't know. Thank you for letting me know we were recording. I thought we were just chatting. No, okay, you good. shouldn't have said anything. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be awesome to me. Yeah, yeah, but I am, yeah, yeah. And I keep saying I'm going to tell you later, so I don't want to tell you later. I'll whenever you want, I can tell you anything now. Yeah. I really enjoy this, yeah, actually, if you want to know. Yeah, it's good, 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 good. So, so uh, let's talk about the change. I mean, okay. uh, the, you, you, you say that there needs to be a change, but actually there is a change. It's happening now. Yes. And so there's really chicken-egg thing there. Um, what is the change that's happening now? And then can you tell me what is the change that must happen after that? Well, the change that's happening now that, that that's, it, it feels so acute is the payment change, right? So, um, and that's what you're seeing on the care provider side, right? And on the insurance side, too. A lot more regulations are happening. So that means um, we're doing part one of the change, and the benefits haven't come yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and health care reform has uh, four 
you know, four components to it, right? One is the um, universal coverage. How, we, how do we get everybody to get insurance, right? Uh, number two, we want to pay for performance. That's what we talked about earlier. Number three, we want consumer choice. So we want um, plans to compete and have choice. Um, and, then, and then the fourth is that they really want to promote quality in this total health that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And reform did a good job of managing the changes in financing on the insurance side, but it fell just a little short on the care delivery side, right? And so we are actively working on, between now and the elections, trying to make sure that everything gets shaped, the regs get written, um, everything gets interpreted in a way that really um, stays on this notion of pay for performance and, um, and to some extent, um, prepaid health care. So you'll hear a lot of um, hopefully in the discussion uh, with the panel about um, accountable care organizations and uh, Queens and HPH, they're all starting to build more vertically integrated models of healthcare so they can be um, accountable and accept prepayment. And uh, that's something that I think will make a big difference because then you're really interested in how do I do well care as, as well as doing sick care. Instead of saying I only get paid to take care of you when you're sick, how do I get paid to keep you healthy? Which is actually more important in terms of, you know, providing somebody with a quality of life throughout his life. Yeah. yeah. You know, it really is. Yeah. And, um, and sometimes you really have to, you have to make it clear to people that it's a life and death matter. Yeah. That they can have a quality of life or not. Yeah. <laughs> you know? There's so much more that's in a person's choice than they realize, so we talked about it earlier, than, than you realize. So we know that 70% um, of people over 50 will have a chronic disease. Right? but half of them could have been avoided. Three big things, um, your weight, um, so you want to, it's exercise, diet, and smoking. Right? And if you can manage those three and get, get rid of smoking, uh, we're a big, you know, don't smoke, um, you can actually avoid the onset in any of those chronic diseases. So that's our big message. And even after 70. Yeah, <laughs> and after 70. Yes. All is not yeah, lost. <laughs> all is not lost. No, 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 no. You know, we talked about the, uh, so when people talk about insurance premiums and the high cost of insurance premiums, I want them to focus on the 90 cents of every dollar, and that's in the care delivery side. And unless we address some of these things that I've talked about, we're never going to get to lower premiums. We'll never get there. If you just want to focus on the 10% on the insurance side and administrative costs, you'll never get there. No. You never get there. No. And it's, again, a win-win for everybody. Good care, better care is, in fact, lower cost. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Kaiser does better, the, the provider does better, and the uh, patient does better. Everybody does better. You know, and, but remember what I said. Um, there, these are, Kaiser has basic building blocks, which can be uh, achieved by other healthcare organizations, and we're seeing it in Hawaii. So. Um, we're vertically integrated, um, and everyone's doing some form of that right now. Clinically connected is really important. What does that mean? That means that we now have information on you anywhere you go. So if you're in, um, uh, and Kaiser's great because we've got 600 facilities across the United States, right? 15,000 doctors, right? So if you're part of the Hawaii Kaiser, you're part of our national family. But what it means is, um, Anywhere you go, any emergency room you go to, you can have access to your record, right? Um, you as a member, if you're a member of Kaiser, I was actually in China a couple of weeks ago talking about health care reform. They're going through reform there mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you could be sitting here in China and log into kp.org and get your record. You know, that's what clinically connected means. So there's a empowerment for individuals, but for your caregivers, it means that you're not a stranger. You're not a stranger. The, your your 50-year history, the different specialists you saw, there. your drugs that you're on that you might not have brought with you is all there. So right. it's all there within the Kaiser system, but what if, what if I'm not in the Kaiser system? Is it all there um, for somebody who isn't in the Kaiser system or vice versa? They're working on it. So um, many hospitals, starting with hospital organizations, are implementing, they've implemented electronic medical records, right? And now they're trying to hook the hospitals up with their outpatient clinics. And um, what will be harder is to get lungs and CVSs and lab and nursing homes all connected to one. So when you're vertically integrated like Kaiser, when you own all the parts, it's a lot easier to get all the information yeah, in sure, place. Sure. When it's a virtual integration, it's a little tougher to get everything at the same time. But they're working on it. Yeah. And, and the goal is that, um, you can diagnose and treat 
much more accurately and much more safely um, if you have all the information. Sure, sure. You know, what we expect doctors to remember, you know, the dozens and dozens <laughs> of patients, don't. They, 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 they don't, they can't, it's impossible, it's impossible. So these tools have really enabled us to get um, um, just a lot more uh, succinct, a lot more specific, and help us not miss anything. Yeah. Well, you said you were in China, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. I wonder if this, if Kaiser could be international, global even, or if it could yeah. connect up in partnerships with, with uh, similar organizations outside the country. And, uh, and when next time you go to China, they'll have your medical records yeah. there. Yeah, you, know? you know, we are, um, on an international basis, I can't tell you how many countries seek us out. I was in the UK a couple of years ago, and then I went to China, and we do information exchange, uh, some consultation. We're not in the business of setting up a business. We've got enough work to do here in the <laughs> U.S. <laughs> but I will tell you that across the world, they look at our model, and they want to figure out what makes us tick and how it works, right? And so we're, I, I like to say we're even more famous outside the U.S. than we are in the U.S. Um, but, you know, no... All the countries that we've, we've t um, over 21 countries have actually visited Kaiser. Um, uh, we have a whole program that they come out to um, in California to visit and to learn about our model. It's a three day um, um, course that we put together. But, um, you know, there's not a country, save maybe Japan on that list, yeah, <laughs> go Japan and Sweden, right, um, that is satisfied with its healthcare um, today. You know, costs are rising everywhere. Um, technology has made life longer for people, um, enables it, and, um, and also you gives see expectations. This. Expectations, and you see it. Part of what's happening in um, when you see what's happening in Europe, it's it's this lifetime expect, expectation, of lifetime medical care. Uh, so it's it's not just a United States issue. Our issue is um, the pace at which um, the rapid pace of the. Um, inflation is is um, astounding compared to other countries so uh, you know people say that Kaiser will be the prevailing model that that as things you know migrate evolve in healthcare and it'll be stresses and strains mm -hmm. but at the end of the day your HMO kind of model will 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 actually be the most popular one um, what happens then you won't be alone anymore um, you'll have competition from all yeah. sides yeah. Uh, the world will be different for you. We welcome it. We're like, come on board. It's actually harder to be um, the only one. Mm. I actually mm. think that, you know, the, it, I look forward to when um, healthcare, uh, you know, what we do is the norm, right, in terms of thinking about the basic building blocks. And so I, what I say is you don't have to be Kaiser exactly, um, but you need to have these these building blocks in place. And different organizations are going to come at it from different ways. But you, you'll, you'll never get to, how do I get the money flow to reward me to keep people well? That's what you've got to get, got to get in place. Because then people follow the money. Yeah. That, so and that's the business of healthcare. Is that the secret, you know, namely keep them well, uh, do preventative medicine, and then all the other factors in play will actually not raise costs or not raise costs so much. I mean, we do have labor issues where labor is yeah. going to be more expensive. Mm -hmm. We have technology, although technology is more powerful all the time, it's still more expensive mm -hmm. uh, to have the technology than not to have it. Right. Um, you know, real estate issues, uh, gee, everything around you is going up. Right, sure. Healthcare is going up, so how do you use your model to prevent that from happening? Yeah, it, it is. It, it, there's going to be a great level setting, right? There will be a big drop when um, these changes come into place. And for Kaiser, um, we just get smarter and smarter about what we're doing and how, and how we're doing it. Our, our challenge is always to get any best practice that we uncover in one county, how do we spread it to, you know, nine million members across the nation. Mm -hmm. That's always our challenge. Uh, but we're fortunate that we learn from um, all the work our colleagues are doing across the country. Right? And so we're, we, we talk to each other. Uh, one great study, I'll talk to you about osteoporosis. One great study that we did that was five years um, over in Southern California was looking at osteoporosis. So if you're um, over 50, half the women and a third of the men will have osteoporosis. Right, so a high number of people without osteoporosis. Um, and if you end up um, 
breaking your hip, breaking a major leg bone, right, and ha experiencing a fracture, 25% of the people will end up in nursing homes, 50% will not recover. You, you may recover, but you'll never have the full functional status you once had. And you're on right, the decline. Law, right, you're on the decline, right, it's the beginning of the decline. 25% of the people will die, right. So we looked at and said, well, what can we do to, pr to improve the odds, right? Does it have to be that, that we know that, that inevitably you're going to have a fracture and this is going to happen to you? And we found out by um, simple things like, um, yes, there's some um, anti-osteoporosis medication, right? But identifying it early that you have onset and that you're getting the proper medication. But even a bigger deal was exercise, strength conditioning, and going to your home and making sure that we walk through with you all the different ways that your house is treacherous. Rugs, stairs, handrails, getting in and out of the bathtub, all of those things to prevent falls. Because that's usually what happens is you fall. The you fall is really deadly at an advanced age, for yes, sure. Yes, the fall. And so at the average cost of 33000 33, for each fracture that has to be addressed, right, if you could reduce the number of actual fractures, you'd save money, right? You'd save cost, the cost of care. Mm -hmm. And you'd improve quality of life for people, right? Because mm -hmm. who wants to be in a That's nursing home or, right, exactly. So uh, here in Hawaii, we have um, about 245,000 people are with osteoporosis or have early signs of onset of osteoporosis, right? 245,000. We're going to spend roughly $230 million this year on broken bones, taking care of broken bones. So our study showed that you can prevent, uh, they, they targeted 25%, they had about 37% reduction in the number of broken bones. If you could reduce it by 30% here, you could save $70 million a year in treating broken bones. Is that worth it? Yeah. Is that, you know, it, that's it's great a, it's analysis, very, it's too. A great, it's, it's, yeah. it's looking at the experience factor, looking mm -hmm. at your whole system, doing macro evaluation. Yes. Uh, and then you can make some great decisions that way. We have the largest database now with these records. We talked about why I have electronic records. Yeah. We have the largest civilian database outside the military uh, with longitudinal data uh, and uh, information about disease, treatment, what works, what doesn't work. Gives you a huge advantage. It, it does. You figure we, out the macro. Yes. We publish our results. It's shared. We partner with um, medical institutions, different foundations, um, National Health Institute to do these studies. People want access to our database. We actually have the largest um, DNA database now in the world. Right outside of Sweden. <laughs> outside <laughs> really? of Sweden, yes, That's yes, yes, they yes. Do that, yeah. yeah, so because they do it automatically for everybody who's um, mm -hmm. everyone in the country. Yeah, and so right now we're studying genetic markers. It's ama It's incredible. Oh, see, you, it's you incredible. have to be a big organization to do that. And yeah. so all the smaller organizations, even if it's a hospital mm -hmm. that's big in one location, doesn't have the the range in other locations. Right. Uh, you have an advantage because you can do the demographics on everybody. Yes. And you can take DNA markers from everyone, and you can learn things that nobody else knows. Yes. Because every time you look at your database, you look at it differently, right. with a more sophisticated analysis. Right. And that's the raw material of solving anything. I mean, medicine has changed so much from one doc in an office, one doc in a doc house by them, by his, him, by herself or himself. And yet, healthcare is intensely personal, right? Yeah. It's no one else can experience what you're experiencing, but yeah. except between you and your physician. And so, what, what we like to talk about is how do you take all that information and actually personalize the experience even more, right? Um, and go beyond what a single physician can remember, right? And in our in a system like ours or anyone else who who emulates these building blocks. Um, it should be whether you go to a pharmacist, your physical therapist, your doctor, your nurse, um, your cardiologist, your endocrinologist, all the different ists, <laughs> they all have that information about you. And that's the difference between what we call connected care. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of, so when people say things are changing, it's, some of it is exciting, positive, right? We lead the world in advances in healthcare the world, right? So um, that's the exciting part. And the, the part for us, for Kaiser, that's exciting right now is that everybody's getting on the same boat. You find we yourself like at the it. front of the pack somehow, yeah, and there you yeah. are. There is, there is, you know, I, 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 like I said, we, we welcome it. 
because trying to educate employers, trying to educate politicians, the general community and all this is complicated. That's why I appreciate having time to, to talk to you. It's a very complicated topic. And so if all of us are talking about it, uh, it's more believable. Right. Yeah. And it gets repeated over yeah. and over again. No, thank you for thank person. you for talking to us. Yeah, about it. yeah, yeah. It's great yeah. that you're raising um, this issue. You know, healthcare here in Hawaii. Uh, people say, well, you know, I often wonder why more people are not talking about healthcare in Hawaii. It's the fourth largest economy in our state. Right. Seven billion dollars a year of healthcare dollars are spent. One in every eleven jobs, and they're good-paying jobs here in Hawaii good paying jobs, lots of our middle class um, is supported by jobs in health care, right? Um, and it's it's an important social issue for us. Sure. Well, you affect, you affect people where they live. So, but you know, meanwhile we have two hospitals that are in bankruptcy and they're not uh, sure they can stay open on a given yes. day and, and we have doctors leaving town and um, I know that's not in the yeah. Kaiser system, but uh, what's your take on that? Uh, why, why we have all these issues around providing health care in Hawaii? Well, um, it is true that federal reimbursement is lower here in Hawaii, um, and that's just an artifact of, of how the method was set, you know, back in the 80s. Um, I also think there's a high cost of living. It's the same reason that it's hard to recruit doctors, it's hard to recruit other professionals. It's the high cost of living in Hawaii and um, school system, right? So if you want to raise, we, we are successful in bringing doctors here to Hawaii and um, as soon as they have their third kid and they're looking at um, affording school, they say, I got to move back to the mainland where yeah. I can put my kids in public school yeah. and um, they'll get a good education. And it's not to say that we don't have good um, schools uh, here and there, but overall, um, Things need to improve. Sure. So, that, so, so the whole business community is faced with these issues. Yes, exactly. It's not just healthcare. Exactly. It's not just healthcare. Healthcare is not no different in that way. Um, but physicians can do better in their reimbursement from the federal government by living in another county. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so there's yeah. an incentive, incentive yeah. involved. In yeah. Even if, even if so, I'm Kaiser and I'm taking care of a Medicare patient here. So you're in Hawaii, and if you're in like um, Sacramento, you know, in California. I, I receive 30% less payment uh, revenue for the same care, you know, so if, if my member move to Sacramento, the, that my Kaiser colleagues get 30% more money. <laughs> Same care, same patient, same person. Maybe we would have more <laughs> more counties in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what to do. We got to talk to our senators and our congressmen, yeah. and that's where um, I'm really excited too. That um, now all of the insurance um, that um, well HMSA is now doing Medicare Advantage. So part of healthcare reform is they close down some of the cost plans, so everyone's yeah. got to participate with MA yeah. Medicare Advantage. So now we all are motivated to lobby on the same issues as well. It's confusing too. Um, our civic leaders when, and if I'm saying something, HMSA is saying something, or HMA is saying something, if we're all joined together with a common advocacy, sure. um, together with the hospitals in town, it, sure. we can affect change. Yes. Not only that, but if you are together, then the public is less confused. Yes. They understand there's one message. Yeah. You know, yeah. Be, what about the doctors on the neighbor islands? You know, the fact that uh, at least the medical community in general, uh, I don't know how it works with Kaiser, but in general, um, you know, it can't support a, an orthopedic surgeon in Hilo, that sort of thing. Yeah. So what are you doing about that, but what can be done about it, and what's the effect of not doing anything about it? Well, it is, it is, uh, and we're, it is true, and as more um, specialists, in particular, retire, um, it's very difficult to recruit. So the hospitals will try to hire physicians and bring them in, um, and that's one one model is that the independent practitioner can't survive, so the hospitals need to hire the physicians and bring, put them on salary and stabilize their income and bring them in. So that is a, potentially a direction. Mm -hmm. You're seeing it in the private hospitals and with Queens and HPH, but, but the state hospitals have not moved to that, with the exception of Maui Memorial, mm. which brought in um, cardiovascular surgeons. Mm. As, as, Example. That's so that's job security, and yeah. it's a, uh, and he stable gets a deal income. where he knows where he's stable income. Yeah, he is, he can he can depend on the doctors to be there to take the patients in an emergency situation and for scheduled uh, procedures yeah. because they weren't coming to the island on their own. Yeah. So that's just an example. Yeah. You know, Kaiser does. We have 21 specialties that uh, fly over to the neighbor islands 
to provide care. Um, we provided over uh, just about 1,400 visits to Neighbor Island. Wow. Um, they fly over, you take the 5.30 flight, I'll go to Hilo, and they'll spend the whole day there. Um, and we either do the procedures in our, um, in some cases we have um, surgery centers, in some cases we rent in town for different places uh, to do interesting. that. Interesting. Yeah, it, it's, um, so we cover our folks. Um, wherever they are. Yeah, wherever they are, because that's part of our, if we, if we can't take care of our member, we shouldn't be bringing on new members, right? Um, and it's not, I'm not just saying it's easy, it's a challenge to have that expectation. And that's why we're always being we're really careful about how much do we, uh, you know, how much, how many members can we actually add on the neighbor islands because it gets more and more challenging. Yeah. Um, but in Kona, um, we're doing so well there in our growth that we decided we're going to build a larger facility and and have, instead of having physicians fly over, we're finally at a critical mass yeah. where we can have the physicians based in the community, yeah, yeah. right? Live there and be there. That's the kind of examination, exa evaluation you have to make. At where is the critical mass point, yeah, and yeah, then you act. Yeah. But, it, but uh, I will say, because you, you know Josh is one of the panelist leaders, Josh Green, Dr. Green, and it is a crisis um, to cover emergency care at the hospitals. We'll talk about that. Yeah, it is, um, um, you know, when you're, you show up in the ED and there is not a specialist to come, because uh, nobody's on, and you're waiting in the emergency room or in the hospital mm. uh, because they can't treat until they know uh, and or they can't treat because they don't have the skill yeah. so you're waiting yeah. and I think that's um, pretty tough we had a we had a situation where um, and it's and I'll, this is not just an isolated story but we've had situations where our physicians are covering call say on the big island and um, it's not a Kaiser patient but we do community call so we so we'll, we'll come across a non Kaiser person and we're trying to find somebody on Oahu to take them because they need to be flown over and really they go to Queens C can't find anybody to take them it's hard because you're calling and they're saying I'm not taking new patients I'm um, and that's that's part of the challenge. It's a, it's a, it's yeah. a, it's, it's an unfortunate to that. story. To that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's tough. We have a few more minutes, and yes. I know that you want to do. <coughs> Let me ask one have more. A panel, a question for the panel. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah. I just wanted to ask uh, one sure. more thing, and that was, um, oh, the emergency room mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. Uh, you know, people say that emergency rooms, uh, some people, some people don't have health insurance, and they wind up spending their medical time in emergency rooms rather than with an internist yeah. or anything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that has an effect on Kaiser like everybody, every right. other hospital. Right. Is that part of the problem we're going to have to solve and how do we solve it? Yeah, by the time people are showing up in the emergency room, they, they missed all that preventive care we talked yes, about. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Right. So, so they come in an acute stage, so right, right away they need the you know, every single piece More of technology. Expensive. Exactly, right. So that's that's one issue, right? So you're treating them late, so it's gonna be more complicated. Um, and then you then that's one group. The other group is a convenience issue. I have I'm not feeling well, I work Monday through Friday, I don't have time to come in, I'm just gonna go to the E D on Saturday, right? And that is um, a really poor use of the resource because, and this is my, you know, campaign on it, because there's people who really need to be seen in the ED because they've got a critical issue. They're displaced. And you've got a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you clog up the emergency room. Um, you know, it's, 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 you want to get your care at the right time at the right place, and um, the ED is not the right time and right place unless you truly have an emergency event. You're in a car accident. Yeah. You are crashing, um, which you want to go there so they can stabilize you and then get you to where you need to go. But this is one of those items that we should address in order to constrain costs, in order to keep the costs at a reasonable level. Yeah. This, this takes it much too high. Yeah, if people start using emergency rooms, in fact, there are hospitals, so if you, if you, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're a hospital, and there's lots of hospitals actually in on the mainland who advertise, come to the ED, we'll get you seen in 30 minutes, mm. right? Because they can charge, you can't get out of the ED without charging $3,000. Three, five, seven thousand dollars. Send that bill to the insurance company, and they get paid. Hmm. It's a, it's actually a very lucrative money maker for people who aren't really ill, and are seen there. Yeah. Because you can run a lot of tests and do all of that. Yeah. If you're in the insurance company, you're saying, please don't go to the emergency room, because you could have gone to the doctor's office 
and it would have been a claim for two hundred dollars instead of three thousand yeah. dollars, right? And in the end, in the end, we all get to pay for that. We all get to pay for it, yeah. and that's why um, the the um, you know that goes back to you pay for sick care. Um, there's an incentive for a hospital to want to see. Um, relatively well people in their ED because they can make a lot of money, right? And this is a, this is a true story. There are billboards, yeah. billboards, hospitals yeah. that say 30 minutes. This is like that uh, story on 60 Minutes a year ago, uh, how they were uh, using this, this uh, Medicaid, I guess, to support people in life, life support systems when there was really no purpose in continuing. They'd been blotto for years, mm -hmm. and it was running $10,000 a day at that time. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure it's more now yeah. um, with no, really, no real purpose. Mm -hmm. And their relatives would say, no, keep them alive. Mm -hmm. But it was a bad decision. Yeah, you know? yeah. I want to say that, too, Hawaii is, um, uh, the healthcare community is really collaborative. It's very collaborative focused on the right thing, um, but we have unique challenges because of our geography. Yeah. Um, so. Well, what's your advice uh, to the uh, questions, right? your advice to the panels? Uh, I'm sorry, really sorry, you yeah. won't be there, uh, but maybe you can help the panels <laughs> by suggesting topics, uh, issues that they should cover. I have. I, I could probably guess what what's going to be talked about, and uh, and I, I would say that um, I hope that that the audience um, at the end of this appreciates really the high caliber leadership that we have in healthcare here in Hawaii and um, the, um, the intent and direction that we're leading today. But what I want to challenge the panel is, is a question around, um, I think of Hawaii as back in 1974 when we passed the prepaid act, we led the nation right long before conversations about healthcare reform and universal coverage. We attempted it and we got almost there, right, with the prepaid act. And it took a handful of individuals to lead the charge, right, to um, create um, what has become a national model. So my question is, 38 years later, here in Hawaii, my argument is that the national reform is not good enough. So who are the handful of individuals that are going to lead Hawaii to once again lead the nation and finally get over the finish line to get to 100% universal coverage. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. That's the okay. challenge. We can we can do more to shape healthcare in Hawaii. Uh, we and we have a, a governor who's very interested in healthcare, is very savvy on healthcare. We could shape shape it here in a way that can work for us here in Hawaii. But it's going to take a handful of leaders to yeah. make that happen. As always, yeah. <laughs> and uh, what what's your advice to uh, people in general? Uh, <clears throat> I mean. A lot of people, they limit their contact with medicine to their visit to the doctor, mm -hmm. uh, their visit to uh, Long's Drug Store, <laughs> you know, and they're writing checks uh, or having their employer write checks for uh, health care insurance. Yeah. But what's your advice to them? Uh, should they come to a program like this? Should they be involved? Should they discuss and participate and develop opinions on the subject? Oh, at, well, you know, it starts by having these kind of conversations, the, like what you're putting together with this panel, education, raising consciousness about what's really happening in healthcare and the cost. It's, it's a societal issue. Without health, right, um, uh, I believe a community cannot progress, right? And ultimately, ultimately, um, even when I see um, uh, people who ha feel like they have their financials settled, um, when you're sick and you're lying in that hospital bed, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. Nothing else matters, right? And eventually, we'll all have our turn there. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just, it's it's a, it, it is uh, uh, a hallmark of a thriving community to have good health, right? And we need to be in, invested in this in more than just looking at, you know, insurance premiums for businesses. Yes, that's important, right? It's it's a fast-growing cost. But we also need to attend to how do we keep our community healthy and thriving. And that's um, why I'm excited, actually, about some of the things that we're seeing coming forward. It's actually, uh, it's, it just depends on where you sit. You can be uh, a little mix of uh, excitement and terror. <laughs> <laughs> but I am, I'm really looking forward to the changes that are coming. It won't be easy. It's not going to be easy, but it's, everything is moving in the right direction. So your prediction is an optimistic one. I, yeah, I, I think I think that it's going to be hard, 
um, there's going to be a transition period that would be difficult, um, but I'm very optimistic on where this is going. And if a few handful of individuals, AJ, you want to help help out with that, <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, really want to shape reform here for Hawaii in a unique way that addresses where we're at today, which is already 92 percent uh, coverage, uh, and what we can do about it to close the rest of the gap. Yeah. You know, I was going to say, Janet, uh, that. Um, you love your job because it's obvious that you love your job. But I learned something else in the past half hour or so. I, I learned that uh, through your job, you've learned to really care. Maybe you did before, but at the moment, it's clear that you really care about the community and you care about the health of every living being around you. And this is very wonderful, actually. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk about it. It takes, it takes 30 minutes. <laughs> it takes a while to explain all of this. And that's why um, the media doesn't, the media in Hawaii does not do health care justice. Uh, so maybe you can help us out there by really calling on your colleagues in journalism to step up their game when it comes to reporting on health care. I will yeah. try to do that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for Good. that. Good. Thanks, Jay. Thank I want to, before we actually oh. break, um, let me just ask you to explain yes. these charts sure. you gave to me. Uh, I'll take a quick picture yes. of this one. Yep. And, uh, yeah. And, yeah. We, we can, I can edit you can, it. Yeah, you can keep those. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yeah. tell us what they are and what they mean to you. Um, so th what this just tells you in the US, US the, in the United States, right, um, health care costs are the, have been for, since 1960, right, the um, fastest growing cost in the United States, fastest growing industry in the United States, right? And so um, for good or for bad, um, we've had a 8,254% um, <laughs> increase uh, since 1960 in, in um, health expenditures and only a 2,645. So three times the rate of any other, um, any other product we produce, healthcare, right? Now, one would say, well, that's why healthcare is so great in the United States. Right? So while it is true that we spend on the second chart, we have the highest per capita, um, you can see by far where we're spending over, you know, f uh, 40, 4,500 per capita uh, spending on health care per person. And you can see in a country like Japan, maybe they're spending 2,500. Um, you would think that we would have the healthiest, longest living um, people of any country. And the truth is we don't. Our average life expectancy is um, just slightly better than um, Cyprus and Ireland and somewhere close to Cuba, <laughs> which is shocking for people <laughs> really? that of um, the, you know, when you look at infant mortality rates, uh, immunization rates, uh, average life expectancy, we're, we're below developed countries. We look like a third world country. And that should suggest to you that something's broken in, in the United States. Yeah. If, if you think about how much we spend, every, there should be no one in the United States that doesn't have access to health care. Yeah. It's just plain and simple. You've got to pay more attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Thank Janet. you. Thank you, Jay. Great to Thank talk you. with you. Thank you. Thank you.